Welcome. This is Thursday, July 1. It's the first day of July and the last day of our class sessions. Math 264, Introduction to Ordinary Differential Equations at Delta College. And we got some announcements to run through. And I definitely want to do some examples for you today focused on convolution. But if you have other problems you want to see examples of, you can just throw them in the chat and I'll put them on the list. The problems I've thought of today, mostly out of 6.5, but they do refresh your memory and other things too. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's go over these announcements, then we'll take a quick website tour, then we will get moving. Number the paper, got it. Okay, bring some people in the classroom, got it. So on to the announcements. Uh, by now you're aware that exam three will be released tonight at 11.59. This is Thursday, July 1. It's due on Tuesday, July 6 by 11.59. So standard procedure except one extra day for the holiday. Uh, you currently have all your graded homeworks in your return papers folder. You'll submit a homework, two problems tonight. I will grade them as quickly as possible. And I'll put your final graded homework and pre-exam grade report in your returns paper folder tomorrow. And yeah, I announced that with an email. So you will have, you know, everything but your exam in your hands tomorrow. Of course, all solutions are posted on the website, but you'll have your own solution back. After you submit exam three, I will grade it as soon as possible. And uh, I anticipate that'll be by July 7 or 8, because um, you won't hand it in until July 6 at midnight. And after I grade your exam, I'll put the graded exam, final grade report into your return papers folder. And again, notify you by email and submit grades to the college. So everything will be there by the time you get notified by email, you can work on your transferring. Now the returns papers folder, I cannot maintain indefinitely. And in fact, these are your papers and I shouldn't even be holding them at all in a manner of speaking. If we were in a classroom, I would return the piece of paper to your hand. Uh, the fact that I'm still holding your papers is got its pluses and minuses, but I won't hold them indefinitely. I just, they're not my papers. So the return papers folder will be emptied and deleted two weeks after I tell you that you're graded exams and final grade reports are posted. You probably have been downloading your papers anyway, but I'm saying that you want to take all the papers out of that folder, grade reports if you want them, certainly the final grade report would be handy, all your graded papers, et cetera. You take those out, store them as you see fit. I'll give you two weeks to do that after I send you the email telling you that you're graded exam and final grade report are posted. After that, I will simply delete those folders because I gotta move on to the next class. Okay, so that's the plan. Let's go to our website just to remind you where you find the exam. So we're over here at our website, semesters 264, week six, yeah. You know, under assessments or on our resources page. The exam will show up right here. The instructions for the exam are currently posted. They're the same instructions shed for the first two exams, except for the date. Uh, but I'll turn on this link to exam three. I'll take off the instructions because the instructions are inside exam three. Please follow the instructions as you have done so far. And uh, I'll also post solutions 
after I return your graded papers. Uh, I keep the website available for a while, but I can't tell you when I'm going to recycle this website. So again, if you wanted a copy of the solutions for yourself, that's uh, you, you have time to collect that or you have been collecting that as we go along. Okay, let me turn that off. You, these are the two homework problems that are you going to submit tonight. 646 alt and 659 alt. I did have an error in the original posting of 659 alt. So you know that you received an email yesterday, last night, saying that a corrected version of this had been posted in case you had previously worked on it. It wasn't a big issue. It was just, you know, something that wasn't fully stated. So Yes, now the current version is here. If you haven't looked at it yet, at least this version is correct. Okay, got it. Stop sharing, back to paper, and here we go. So this is my goal. And I also want to, you know, like go full circle with you in the class. And that is from the very first day, we've said to you that you should consider all of your problems, but certainly the problems in this class, analytically, qualitatively, and numerically. You know, the, look at the whole solution, kind of a holistic approach. And so we have told you what convolution is, but I haven't really illustrated how it could be used. And now I'm gonna give you the explanation of how it could be used. And I would like to give you three examples and just to close the loop, a qualitative example, an analytic example, and then a numerical example. And uh, as you go down the list, uh, you might consider about dealing with some real life situations. Yes, we talked yesterday about numerically and numerical estimates. This numerical example that I'm gonna show you in a spreadsheet, which is posted to our website, this would be the closest I'm gonna to come to maybe your future reality in an engineering context. Certainly you'll do things analytically and qualitatively in an engineering context, you always should do that. But many, many times you're gonna be looking at numerical data and here's a kind of a fun and shocking power of convolution in this example I've prepared. Qualitative example is still kind of theoretical. Well, it's qualitative. It's describing the quality of what convolution does. This is, I don't like to use the words easy, medium, hard, because, you know, everything is easy or nothing is easy. So, but, uh, and then basic and not basic. You, you don't prejudge problems. But how about, Uh, I, I okay, I'll use easy, medium, hard for once. This is kind of the easiest illustration I can give of convolution. It's not super duper realistic, but it's got some qualities to it. Analytically, this is something you could use in the field. Uh, medium interesting. And I don't want to say hard, but the numerical example I'm giving you is not quite boots on the ground, real life on the floor at GM, but it is a little more advanced. So that's the plan. So we're going to do this with three problems. So let's call them one, two, and three. And let's jump right to problem one, which is in your book. So I will share it with you as soon as I locate it. Um, so I'm talking about section six, five. And I'll bring it up in my electronic book and then I'll show it to you. It is exercise 6.5, number seven. 
And it is still, uh, the solution to this is already posted, but still it'd be worth discussing the solution to you. What's the logic? What's the philosophy of doing this problem? Well, bef and I'll show, before I show you the problem, let's, let's talk a little bit. Maybe I shouldn't have written the problem down first and then talked. Let's talk a little bit about the logic of what we're doing with convolution. We're used to this. particularly in a mathematics class. We have input. We have a system or a problem. And to represent a problem, I'll use our favorite icon, the damped harmonic oscillator. in its full glory with forcing function, spring constant mass and damping coefficient fixed. And then there are other versions of this, by the way, but that's okay. And then we have output. So let's think about this really carefully. You're used to someone defining a problem, telling you what the initial parameters are, and then asking you to solve it. Solve is the output, you know, solve for X, stuff like that, right? And you, you've also done this logic all day, every day of your life. You know, if, if you have three quantities that you're looking at and someone tells you two of the quantities, then you have over and over again demonstrated that you can usually figure out what the third quantity is. You know, if I know two of the three things, and they're related, I can figure out what the third thing is. So you're used to this being the unknown. And you're used to these two things as being known. Someone tells you the conditions and describes the problem. But what if we reversed that? Where I do not tell you what's inside the box. I might describe the input to you. I might describe the output to you. But I don't tell you the exact parameters of what's inside the box. You know, people like to poetically call this a black box. You don't know what's inside it. There's a damped harmonic oscillator in here, but I'm not going to tell you the mass or the stiffness of the spring or the damping coefficient. What if these were the two things that were known? And this was the thing that was unknown. This is exactly what convolution is built for. And it's actually a very, very practical problem because you might have some type of system that you don't for exactly how it works. But you send an electrical signal in, you get an electrical signal out, you tap it on the outside, you see a response on the inside, you make a deduction about what's in the middle. This is like what people commonly call in the public, reverse engineering a problem. 
and you did do it in your early math classes where someone gives you the answer and then you try to figure out how that's the answer to the problem, so to speak, right? That's like working backwards. Sometimes people call it working backwards. And I'll tell you an example I saw uh, in uh, the student club labs at U of M the other day, it was probably a couple of years ago, you know, they, where they keep the solar car, where they keep the plane, that the student clubs work on these very cool things, gives them very practical experience. In one corner, there was a John Deere tractor. And, uh, you know, going on tour, so what's, what's the John Deere tractor doing right here? Are they mowing the grass outside? No, John Deere had given the student lab the tractor and asked the student lab to advise it or, or come up with some interesting solutions. And uh, for the same reason that if you see a UPS truck or a FedEx truck driving by where the driver's got no door on, right? But the reason, and, and the fact that you got no door on means you can look at the driver's seat. And the seat that the driver sits on in those trucks is significant. It looks like something out of Terminator or something. It looks like a fancy machine. And why is that? Because the drivers spend a heck of a lot of time sitting in that chair. They've got some kind of cool, sophisticated chair that minimizes damage to their body because they are constantly starting, stopping, hopping in, out, blah, blah, blah. The same thing with the John Deere tractor. You're sitting on that rideable tractor and it's not always comfortable. So John Deere had donated this to the student lab, said, can you help us make the seat more comfortable, less vibrations, stuff like that. In that sense, that seat was like a damp harmonic oscillator, a black box. And the input was the spinning of the blades and the angles of the motion. And the output was you got this very, very jarring bad ride possibly. So could you deduce how to given these inputs, how to tune that seat in the tractor or in the FedEx truck so that the output was minimally disruptive. Well, the, the, the answer to do that means you gotta know what's making that seat tick first. You gotta know how it's behaving. And the seat doesn't come with a label that says, this is the effective spring constant of the seat. And this is the effective damping coefficient of the structure. You have to deduce those things. Okay, this is called reverse engineering. And well, in public, it's called reverse engineering. And the convolution is seriously built for this. So now let's look at this problem and you can understand now what this problem is really saying. Uh, let me pull this up now. Where is it? There's my book. Go to the next screen and I'm looking at problem seven and I'm gonna hide that and so I can expand problem seven. Give me a moment to get this under control. Here we go. Suppose, uh, I'm not totally up on all my Greek letters, but I think that's a zeta. Suppose, the solution zeta of the initial value problem has a certain Laplace transform whose value is zero, I'm sorry, whose value is one fifth if S is zero and whose value is one seventeenth when S is two. Can you predict P and Q? So this is, the most basic, I think, example of what I mean by reverse engineering. You are handed a damped harmonic oscillator. Let's assume this is a damped harmonic oscillator, P and Q positive. And what's the Dirac function at zero mean? You give it a tap at zero. You give it an impulse hammer tap at zero. And what's the Y of zero equals zero, Y prime of zero equals zero mean? This damped harmonic oscillator is just sitting there at rest. You tap it, and what you get is a solution. You get an output called zeta. Zeta is a function that makes this 
sentence true. And by looking at zeta, by recording the Laplace transform of zeta on your whatever a scope, you observe that the Laplace transform of zeta goes through one fifth when s is zero and goes through one seventeenth when s is two. Well, this is the classic example of give me two pieces of data and I'll predict two values. So I'm not going to tell you anything about P and Q. I'll just tell you how the system behaves. And you will predict for me the qualities, the parameters of the system. OK, watch. So now we're going to do this example. And the three examples that I'm going to give you today, the first two clearly refer to your homework problem. So that'll get you started. 6.5, number seven. So I've got this differential equation, y double prime plus p y prime, I'm going to use the prime language, q y equals to rock function at zero. I just tap it at zero. And the system is initially in the equilibrium position, not moving. And when you're in the equilibrium position, not moving, you could call that at rest, so to speak. Sometimes people use that as a shortcut for that. Because if you're displaced from the equilibrium position and not moving, you're being held back from moving. You are not at rest. Uh, but be careful how people use that word, at rest. OK, so we're given that zeta of t solves star. Now look at these two initial conditions and how they're going to help me. So that means when I apply the Laplace transform to this, Laplace transform y double prime plus p Laplace transform of y prime. I usually don't write it out in this much detail. Plus q Laplace transform of y equals Laplace transform of the heavy side function at zero. I can just say straight away s squared ly, ply, psly, excuse me, plus qly, because there are no initial conditions to pay for here. The initial conditions are both zero. And this, I know the Dirac function transform is e to the minus a s. Of course, e to the minus 0 s is 1. So look what this reduces to. s squared plus p s plus q. Oh, I should be sharing my screen, but maybe you're already doing that. So I've already written down the problem, or I'll come back to it later. So yeah, back to my paper. s squared plus p s plus q l y is 1. That means l y. Now what is y? y is zeta. Zeta solves star. So that means if I put zeta in here, this is all true. So the Laplace transform now of zeta, put a little curly q, come back and put a tail on it, is 1 over s squared plus ps plus q, which we recognize as representing the characteristic equation of this problem. Well, look at that. Here's an example with s, p, and q. And then you were given two values of s. And you were given two outputs for the Laplace transform of zeta. Let's write them down. So. Uh, I go back to my paper, but I'm not going to share the paper again with you. Back to my book. When s is zero, the transform was one fifth. When s was two, the transform was one seventeenth. Let's put those in there, create two equations, and show you that they predict what p and q are. So when s is zero, I get one over q. So automatically, q is 5. 
when s is two, I get a little more work here. Looking at my paper. When s is two, I get a little more work here. I get four, two, p, and q. One over four plus two p plus q. Well, that means four plus two p plus q is 17, just by reciprocal. He set this up so that it would be a mellow algebra work. They set this up. So q is five, five and four is nine, subtract nine, eight, p is four. So let's look at this schematically. You had a system that underneath you knew that's why I'm going to write in a light color right here. Underneath, you knew this as a damped harmonic oscillator. In this case, you knew the mass was one, but you did not know the stiffness of the spring, which is represented by Q, and the damping coefficient, which is represented by P. Right? You knew the out the input you were putting in, but this was a black box. You didn't know what was inside, but you recorded some outputs. Oh, the Laplace transform. Oh, sorry. Uh, da, 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 da. You, you recorded the solution. This is a funny other Greek letter, zeta of t. And you noticed that the Laplace transform of zeta was one fifth at s equals zero and the Laplace transform of zeta, I'm try to center my paper was 1 17th at s equals two. So this, these two facts represent the fact that you recorded the output. And from these two facts, from the input and the output, you deduced what was inside. Now you know what's inside that box. Now this could be a damped harmonic oscillator, this could be an electrical circuit, this could be a vibration in a beam anything that would be governed by the classical damped harmonic oscillator. You could be tapping it with a hammer. You could be throwing some voltage spike at it. You could be loading it with a mass. I mean, all those words that you guys know way better than I, but this is a classic simple case of you know what people commonly call the public reverse engineering something. In fact, the, you, you might check out the origin of that phrase. Where did that phrase came from? Probably came from the engineers who said, let's work backwards. Okay, so now this is a qualitative description. Let me tell you why it's a qualitative description. Again, no one's ever going to hand you a shoebox with a single damped harmonic oscillator, in it, right? But they might hand you a tractor and ask you to minimize the vibration of the seat. They might hand you a complicated circuit board and ask you what the effective resistance is. I, I know I'm not stating that correctly. In other words, a true mechanical system would have the equivalent of lots of springs, masses, dampers, all kinds of things built into here. But that shoebox acts in a collective way, right? I don't know, I care how complicated that circuit is. When I tap it with a voltage, I get an output. 
And maybe I cannot possibly know all the components that are inside, but I could know how they effectively behaved. Oh yeah, this is behaving in there as if the total resistance was blank. This is behaving in there as if the capacitance, the net capacitance was blank. Again, I'm not an electrical engineer, so I'm not using those terms correctly. Oh, this is behaving in there as if the damping was this strong. So you might know the net behavior of the thing inside. And that's what the P and Q represented here. But the thing inside could be extremely complicated. Okay, so let's go to another example. We love building analytic solutions. So this is my sketchiest example. You know, when examples, sometimes examples don't work. So this would be the one I'm concerned about. It may not work, but we'll give it a shot. This one, by the way, is similar to your homework problem that you're doing. So it's looking a little bit like seven. Well, we just did problem seven, eight, nine, ten. That's what your homework problem looks like. So let's say you had this differential equation y double prime plus 2y prime plus 2y. I'm picking very mellow numbers because I just want to show you a sample calculation. Let's say that we give you initial conditions of zero and zero. So this time I am telling you the components of the system, so to speak, right? And let's give you a very mellow driving function like two. Okay. I now believe, you know, this problem is not on the final exam because even though it's from section 4.1, this was one, like one of the first problems you would do in section 4.1. I think this is problem is beneath you, so to speak. I think you could do this problem very easily. And so I'm not going to do it for you right now. I'm just going to tell you the answer. But you have many methods that you could do this problem. Let's call the answer gamma. Let's say gamma of t, let's call this problem star, like we did last time. Let's say gamma of t solves star. And I'll tell you what gamma of t is. It looks a little bit like a, un, like a balanced y, but it's a Greek letter gamma. Gamma of t is, or I hope I did this right, minus E minus T, cos T, minus E minus T, sine T, and plus one. Now you have all this language at your disposal now. You recognize the plus one represents the YP because this is a constant. So YP has to be a constant and two times Y is two. So the constant has to be one. You've done that trick before. And then you know that the homogeneous solution characteristic values of this will be minus one plus or minus i. That'll produce these two things here. I must have done the work with the initial conditions to fill in these constants of minus one and minus one. So let's assume I did this correctly. Always dangerous, but let's assume I did this correctly. You can check this on your own time. Well, what's left to do? Because your, your first question is right now, Dave, you told us the input, you told us the problem, you told us the answer. There's nothing left to do here. You've revealed the whole thing. Oh, but now you get a new problem. So now your friend comes up to you and asks you for the solution to a new problem. Y double prime plus two Y prime plus two Y equals E to the minus T. Y of zero is zero. Y prime of zero is zero. 
So what's happening here? You got a box, you gave it a tap, you recorded the output. But I did all these things analytically. Exact solution. But now someone comes up to your box, your black box, and gives it a different tap, gives it a different input. Now, I know you could solve double star the same way we solved star. I know you have an analytic technique. But is there any way I can use this idea of reverse engineering? Is there any way I can use this idea of convolution? Oh, by the way, when I go back to the first problem that we just did, I don't didn't have my speaker up. Uh, maybe I should make sure my speaker is up a little bit. It is up a little bit. Maybe some of you were screaming at the screen. Where did you use convolution, David? Maybe we'll come back to that. But here I'm going to openly try to use convolution instead of resolving this. Yes, I know I can resolve it, but that takes time to resolve it, right? Harder driving function, maybe more work. Okay, so now let's use what we're given. So gamma solve star. That means gamma double prime plus two gamma primes plus two gammas is two. Gamma at zero is zero and gamma prime at zero is zero. There's nothing remarkable about writing that because if gamma solves star, it must meet these conditions. Now let's apply the Laplace transform again. And this time I won't hesitate to use any of my shortcuts. Since the initial conditions are zero and zero, I can go straight to S squared plus, sorry, I know the numbers, S squared plus two S, plus two L gamma is the Laplace transform of two, which is two over S. And that means that L gamma is two over S, S squared plus two S plus two. But more importantly, let's focus on our characteristic equation. What it means is one half S L gamma is our favorite fraction, one over S squared plus PS plus Q. How is this going to help me solve the black problem? How is this going to help me solve double star? Well, let's check it out. Let's start solving double star with the Laplace transform. Let's apply. I put apply with a capital L. Let's apply the Laplace transform to double star. Well, again, double star is, is the sweet initial conditions. So I'm going to have s squared ly plus 2s ly plus 2ly. And I know Laplace transform to e to the minus t. So I'll write this down in one stroke. s squared plus 2s plus 2ly equals. And the Laplace transform to e to the minus t is 1 over s plus 1. Very innocent looking. So remember, I'm trying to solve double star. And now I know the Laplace transform of the solution to double star. I keep wanting to say P and Q. 2S plus two, because I'm talking about a specific problem. Now, let's take stock of where we are. This is the Laplace transform of the answer. There can't be anything Better than that, you know, I just do my partial fraction decomposition. I have the Laplace transform. But let's say I was lazy and didn't want to do the partial fraction decomposition. Oh, see, I did that with P's and Q's up here, and I apologize. P is 2, Q is 2. So I got to keep saying 
two and two. I got to make myself say that. I specified the P and Q. But do you see what I can do with that? Since that fraction appears right here, I can replace that fraction with my known solution, Laplace transform, with this expression right here. So that means that L of Y is actually equal to, I'll write it in and then I'll sort it out, one over S plus one, one half S, Laplace transform of gamma. And remember, I know gamma. Gamma is up here. But I don't want to throw that in yet. Let me rewrite this in a different way. Let me rewrite this where I don't look at all the S's, right? Remember this one over S plus one was the Laplace transform of e to the minus t. I'm just showing you another way to look at it. And I'll put the one over s right here, one half, one half s over here. And here's the Laplace transform of gamma. Well, remember the formula for derivatives. Let me center my paper. The Laplace transform of gamma prime is S Laplace transform gamma minus gamma at zero. But gamma at zero is guaranteed to be zero. So the Laplace transform of gamma prime is S Laplace transform gamma. And here I have an S Laplace transform gamma. Let me rewrite. Oops, used up that pen. So we got to get another one. I'll keep this on the screen in front of you. So now just keep hanging in there because I'm trying not to do work, right? One half Laplace transform of e to the minus t times the Laplace transform of gamma prime. But I learned yesterday that the Laplace transform of one function times the Laplace transform of the other is not the Laplace transform or the product of the functions, but it is the Laplace transform of the convolution of the functions. So now I have the Laplace transform of my answer is one half the Laplace transform of the convolution. Or if I wanted to make it even more plain, the Laplace transform of my answer is the Laplace transform of one half of this convolution. In other words, y is one half e to the minus t convoluted with the derivative of gamma. This is a legitimate formula for y. Now let's think about what I did in a qualitative sense. I have this box that's not a black box. You know, y double prime plus two y prime plus y, you know, uh, plus two y, excuse me. I tap it with a two, f of t equals two, and I record an output called gamma. But then my friend comes along and says, what happens if you tap this box with a function called e minus t. Same parameters in the box. Do I have to, classical style, 
do I have to resolve this problem? This solution I wrote above said no. I can predict the answer. I know how to predict the response. I will take the E minus T my friend brought. I will convolute it with the derivative of the thing that I collected up here. And there happened to be a constant of one half. Well, that came from the work with the twos and stuff. Now you might not like this because then you gotta, you're, you're saying to yourself, but wait a minute, uh, that, that convolution integral was a horrible, horrible mess, right? It was kind of hard to read and understand zero to T, E to the minus, T minus U, gamma of U, DU. You're asking me to do that? I'm not asking you to do anything. I'm saying you predicted the answer. You hand that back to your friend and you say, here's your answer. And what your friend does with it is up to them. Your friend probably has some kind of numerical integrating program. Let them go and do it. But you predicted the response with minimal effort. Remember, you've got this differential equation shop where people come to you and buy solutions to differential equations. It's set up on Main Street. And you've already got the answer to this problem. Now everybody else walks in the door based on the same problem and they hand you a whole menagerie, a whole zoo of different driving functions. And you want to give them fast response. Like you're like the McDonald's of differential equations shops. All you do is you take their e to the minus t and you set it right there. And you convolute it with your secret sauce, which is the solution to the base problem that you had already collected. It's the derivative of the solution. But you know how to differentiate this. And you hand them that solution back. In fact, you may even decide so that they don't learn what you're doing and set up a competing shop across the street. You might even decide to take your computer and do this numerical integral and then hand them this solution without telling them where you got it from. It's inside a black box. Your friend walks in with e to the minus t, you give them g of t. The next friend walks in with uh, t squared plus t, you give them h of t. And they're all amazed. But all you did was take t squared plus t, convolute it with your secret sauce, so to speak, and then give them back the answer. Now I'm speaking a little bit qualitatively and a little bit analytically, but this is an integral that can be performed. Uh, in fact, you could perform this integral. You could put the mu in there, uh, the gamma in there and see how to perform this integral. It might be a horrible mess, but it's just exponents, sines and cosines. So you can have a true analytic solution to any function they bring you and it's only based on this one sample answer. That sounds magical. That sounds too good to be true. It sounds like, as people say in English, something for nothing. Are you getting something for nothing here? No, you're not getting something for nothing. Now, the, the reason you're not getting something for nothing is you had to produce this answer. And you can only pull this trick if someone brings you an input to the exact same problem, right? So if your friend comes in and says, well, I want this input, but I want this problem to be changed. Well, then you're gonna have to go back and get another sample solution. But with one sample response, you can predict every other response to that system 
that does sound too good to be true. And, and the weapon is a convolution. You can predict the response. Okay, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I'll do it one more way. Let's go back to here and show you how you could produce the response even better. So let's go to this one half. Let's not put this e to the minus t in here. Let's go s over s plus one l gamma. I guess I can't do it without producing the s plus without producing the e to the minus t in there. But I want to see if I could say this in another way. Not directly. Okay, I'm going to be satisfied with this for this example. Remember, I'm exploiting the fact that s l gamma is gamma prime. So for me to say that this is e to the minus t convoluted with gamma prime is not a surprise from this expression. Remember, the moment I write one over s plus one, I know it came from e to the minus t. And the moment that I multiply two Laplace transforms, I know very well that I cannot multiply their insides, but I am allowed to convolute their insides. So that's just another way of saying, that's how I know that that's the answer, but that's not a new, that's not a new discovery. So I don't wanna overdo that. Okay, what I'm gonna do now and I think we're gonna take a break. We, we've taken late breaks, maybe we'll take a slightly early break. So this is similar to your homework problem. Your homework problem's got maybe one more level to it, but look at the other, look at the other posted solutions to nine and 10 on the website if I have them there. I think I have at least one of those there. And that'll tell you, that'll give you a clue as how you could approach your homework problem. Problem nine, I altered. Problem nine is in the book. The original is in the book with a solution in the back. So you can do problem nine and then attack problem nine alt, so to speak. But here's a really crazy, magic trick. Go back to our numerical weapons, go back to Euler's method. Let's say you're in the shop and you truly don't know what P and Q are. You have a definitely have a black box. And when you tap the black box with some kind of known function, the result that you get out is just a bunch of numerical data on your oscilloscope, just a curve on your oscilloscope, just a reading on your seismograph, whatever you use to measure mechanical vibrations. Can we use our numerical weapons? Can we use Euler's method to make a totally numerical prediction that matches reality? And when I say use Euler's method to make a numerical prediction that matches reality, I acknowledge, you've seen this in Mathematica, that there are many, many numerical methods I haven't taught you that you would learn in special courses uh, that are already built into your calculator. Mathematica said Hermit. Uh, there's the runge Kuda method that's built into the TI calculators. There's lots of numerical games to play to estimate a differential equation. I only gave you one called Euler's method because it's the simplest, but it can be refined significantly. 
when you refine it, you just get more accurate answers more quickly or more accurate estimates more quickly. But I'm not trying to re-demonstrate Euler's method. What I'm trying to do is how you could use a numerical method to make an advanced prediction from only data. That's what I'm gonna show you on the convolution worksheet when we come back. So let's say one, two, let's label this point three. Let's say, let's come back at, these are the examples I want to show you today. Early break, so let's come back at 102. And like I said, if you want to see any particular examples from any of these sections, you have to throw it up here so we can look at it. Okay, I'm gonna mute my microphone and take a break for a second. You can do the same.
Okay, we're back. And I want to show you the funnest and most interesting example. The homework problem you're doing for tonight, 659 alt, is very similar to 659. So you could, if you work through the problem 659, work through his examples, uh, work through his solution in the back, understand why they wrote that. That'll put you on the road to solving 659 alt. It won't solve it for you, but very similar idea. But what I'm about to show you right now is, you know, kind of a little bit off the record. Uh, it's kind of, like I said, something you would do in the future if you were doing a mechanical or electrical kind of situation or borrowing mechanical or electrical problems even other problems. This book had some good examples of applying nonlinear systems to chemical reactions and problems in chapter five. And we didn't spend any time really discussing those, but go back and look at the recommended problem solutions in 5.1 and 5.2. There's a couple of ways you could apply differential equations and systems to observing chemical reactions not doing chemistry, observing the rates of reactions. So, but what I'm doing right now is gonna be just a model, just a sample of something you could do at full scale in the laboratory, in real life. So I gotta prep this a little bit. And that's why I spoke a little bit before we took a break. I want to show you a different way to write Euler's method in a spreadsheet. And the reason I want to do this is because the way I'll show you how to write it, if you followed that method, that's how you could extend Euler's method to third degree equations, fourth degree equations, any degree equations. And sometimes you might want to, but any numerical recipe that someone teaches you you could put in place of Euler's method. You could say, oh, I could use this to rearrange the Runga-Kuda method or the Hermit method. I'm just using Euler's method as the tool in this problem. So let me restate how I'd like to put Euler's method into my spreadsheet. And then I'll show you an actual working spreadsheet where we're doing it and reverse engineering a problem. So you look at your second order problem, your base second order problem. I don't have any problem saying we restrict ourselves to a damped harmonic oscillator. So M1, B is P, K is Q. Just when I set M equal to one, it's called normalizing the problem. You know, just pretending the mass was one. If the mass is a car, then I can make my mass units car units. And then the mass of one car is one. So norm, as long as mass is not zero, you know I'm allowed to divide by M. And I've got some input here, F of T. And I've got some initial conditions. Y at T zero is Y zero. Y prime at t0, which is velocity at t0, is, let's call it v0. I could call it y prime zero. We're using the analogy of position and velocity and acceleration. y is position, y prime is velocity, y double prime is acceleration. Uh, we know we've made this variable switch. Let's let y prime equal to v. And then v prime is y double prime. But if you solve for v prime, if you solve for double prime, what would you have here? Minus qy minus pv 
plus f of t. So this f of t part is the non-homogeneous part. This part that's the v and the minus qy and the minus pv, that's the part that looks like a matrix, looks like a linear system, but this f of t is the input. Okay, this is a non-homogeneous linear system. But instead of focusing on, and this is how we did this in the past. This is how I set up my spreadsheet. Here's a counter. Here's T, here's Y, here's V. Here's the function that describes the change in Y. Let's call it Y prime for a second. In our tables previously, when we executed Euler's method, we called that F and G but I don't wanna ditch this F right here. So F from the Euler's method tables we used previously was the function that described Y prime and G was the function that described V prime. And then you took the elapsed time. And by multiplying the rate of change of Y times the elapsed time, you learned the elapsed Y or the change in Y by multiplying the rate of change in velocity times the elapsed time, you learned the rate of change or the change in velocity. And then you took these three boxes, the results from these three boxes, and you dumped them on top of these three boxes to get your new t, new y, new v. After you were given the original t, the original y, and the original v. So that's kind of a qualitative description of Euler's method. But now instead of concentrating, instead of calling this y prime v prime, instead of saying y v, why don't I just say y and y prime for v? So I could rewrite this table by relabeling the columns. And writing them more efficiently. See, I could have, instead of, you see how I collected numbers in each of these columns from left to right, but I could have built the formula. And then I, I, I wrote formulas in each of these columns and then the formulas produced numbers and the numbers were added to these original columns. But what if I just added the result of the formulas and the numbers to the original columns? So, I eliminate some redundancy in my columns. In other words, you, for example, example of redundancy was dt. Once I set the dt equal to a tenth of a second, well, I knew how all the t's were going to come out. I didn't need a column that kept reminding me 10th of a second, 10th of a second, 10th of a second. And likewise, these two columns, dy and dv are the result of multiplying the 10th of a second times these two columns. So I could erase these two columns and just multiply these two columns by the 10th of a second and add them directly. Oh, I don't need those two columns. I don't need that column. Look at one more efficiency. This V stands for Y prime. But then I repeated the column that said Y prime. So technically that was a repeat right there in this problem. So technically all I need is a Y column and a Y prime column. Now let's look at V prime. What is V prime? V prime is Y double prime. So I need a Y column, a Y prime column, and a Y double prime column with correctly written formulas, a counter column, so to speak, and a timer column. So by relabeling the columns and eliminate 
eliminating some redundancy in my columns, I could present Euler's method like this. Here's the counter column, here's the timer column, here's the column that records position, velocity, and acceleration. And I use each one of these numbers to predict the next position, velocity, and acceleration. I mean, my acceleration, y double prime, is a known, I guess I need an F column, that'll be my input column. The, the, the acceleration is what? Minus QY minus PY prime plus F. So with the F, the Y, the Y prime, I can predict the Y double prime and then refill in these columns. So that would be an efficient way to write Euler's method. Let's open up a spreadsheet. Spreadsheet is called, it's on our website, it's called convolution.xls. So let me go get it. I got to see where we are. Put myself on the correct desktop. Go into my Excel. I, it's, it's on our website. It's in the Google Drive folder, but I'm going to open a copy in front of me on my own machine. So I'm not going to download this. And as soon as I get it open, I'll share it with you. And it's going to look crazy and complicated for a second. But then we'll remind you that these are all the pieces I've described. So I have it here. The numbers are going to be kind of small since this is busy, but let's take a shot at it. Okay, let me share it with you. I got to see how big is that on your monitor. It's not too big. Let me see if I can make that better. From my side, I made all the numbers a little bit larger. And it's a small improvement on your monitors, but I don't know exactly what you're seeing. Okay, let's take a tour of this page. First of all, everything that's in gray and green right here, some kind of whole thing going on in the background. First of all, let's ignore that. So. There's some computations going on in the background. We'll explain them later. Let's look at the header right here. This is our course, blah, blah, blah. I'm showing you an example of numerical convolution. So first, what I did is I built a spreadsheet here that has parameters that I can change at will. But the problem is y double prime plus py prime plus qy equals f of t. And the initial conditions are y at t naught is y naught and y at prime at t naught is v naught. So I didn't even say t naught had to be zero, right? And then right here, I've put together some boxes where I could put in a different t naught, put in a different dt put in a different y naught or v naught, put in a different p or q. So I've built this to be somewhat flexible, although I'm not guarantee that this won't break if you try to use it. I think when you use it and you change these numbers, you'll have to make it your own if you want to try and use it. But Let's just look at this very generically. Uh, the P is two and the Q is 10. Well, you know that that's underdamped oscillation, right? Uh, let's change the initial condition to be one here. 
I'm not going to show you the table yet. I'm just showing you the output. There is a possible underdamped oscillation. Now the solution is being drawn in blue and the driving function, which we'll talk about later is being drawn in black. Notice I'm only doing two seconds of this. And notice if you caught the, count the dots across the screen from left to right, I'm only looking at 20 dots. So remember I said this was gonna be a simulation of a numerical problem in a lab. What happens on your oscilloscope if you have a very old, old, old oscilloscope and it only samples 20 times in two seconds? Well, there is no such thing. But the idea is I'm gonna show you an example where I sample 20 data points. Do you want my example to be more realistic than sample 2,000 data points? But the principle will remain the same. Let me change the initial volume uh, speed here. Yeah, now I get a slope one and a oscillation. Let me change the P and Q so that it's overdamped. Let's make this four. Let's make Q one. Now I'm describing something that slowly returns to zero or to the driving function, which is one. Let's make the thing critically damped. Okay, it's gonna to return to equilibrium more quickly, but equilibrium is not the driving function, it's imitating the driving function. So let's take all your differential equations buzzwords and throw them out the window and just look at this as a numerical example. I'm going to go back to the original numbers I had in here, 2 and 10, and 0 and 0. Now let's go meet the table. So all you want to know right now is I have an oscilloscope in front of me. I or whatever, I have a some kind of measuring device that's telling me, I'm sorry, I'm spinning my finger around and making you dizzy. I have some kind of visual monitoring device that's recording data in front of you. Where is it recording this data from? It's recording the data from the numerical work we did on this problem. And over here on the right, I have, the K, the T, the counter, the timer, the input function, which was constantly one. And then a column that records position, velocity, and acceleration, given this driving function. But I want to predict what happens if I introduce a new signal. And so that's the columns here on the right. Let's say that in a moment, I'm gonna replace this very boring F with a different input, with a different signal. Now right now I just have some numbers randomly arranged here. You're not quite sure what those numbers are. Let me type in a different formula here for you. Let me type in just exponential decay. X minus T, I'll use the T reading. Okay, doesn't like what I did right there. So let's back up, let's try it again. This cell is going to equal exp of, oh, I didn't like that I used square parentheses. I'm so fixed on using square parentheses for Mathematica. I think that's what it was angry about. Yes. Now let's fill down and look at the shaded column in front of you now. The shaded column has numbers that are decreasing, right? Well, in fact, they're decreasing exponentially. 
But look what I did in the red column. And for a moment, and I am going to do this by sharing full screen so you can see any dialog boxes that come up for me. For the moment, let me go back to my paper. Do you see the red columns titled Y prime star G? That stands for Y prime convolute G. Let me go back to our paper. Do you see in this one example that I gave you, I could predict the future by convoluting the input function with the derivative of a sample solution. It's not the only thing I did, but it's one thing I could do with such a problem. But then I reminded you, I gotta see where I put that paper. Oh, I reminded you up here. That convolution to humans is very annoying, right? Convolution to humans, f star g is the integral from zero to t of f of t minus u, g of u du. Even though it's only a single integral, finite interval, this mixing of f's and g's is awkward. It seems awkward to us, but remember, I told you the other day that it's like reading the values of G forwards, reading the values of F backwards, and then multiplying them. It's like taking a column for G and a column for F and multiplying the opposing entries. I didn't draw that very nicely. Let's say F goes from zero to 10 and G goes from zero to 10. Well, it's like taking the 10th entry in F times the zeroth entry in G plus the plus some integral means plus, right? The ninth times the first plus the eighth times the second. So remember, integral is just adding a bunch of numbers. And if I wanted to do this for every second to create a numerical approximation of this, then I just take every new T I create in my table and I perform this backwards dot product, so to speak. And I multiply times the time interval, I have an estimate of F star G. Now numerically, I'm only creating an estimate, but that might be all I have. All I have might be this table of data. I may not have formulas for F and G. I may just have tabular data. So let's go back to the spreadsheet and see how we did this, but this time, I want to share screen so that you can see any dialog boxes that I execute inside Excel, because we're going to do a little more Excel wizardry. Uh, that is not sharing screen. Sorry. Let's try again. Sharing desktop. My fault. Okay. Now you see my whole desktop minus some of the chat things and features like that. that are separate on your screen. Here's my Excel spreadsheet. I'm gonna bring it bigger. And then maybe I can make these numbers bigger. Okay, so I'm just trying to make everything more readable but on your screen because I went to my entire desktop. That does not make things much more readable. Let me see if I can expand a little bit. So here's what I do. I'm going to use my new signal G, and then I'm going to convolute it with Y prime because I get this response that came out of F. Notice I call this the response derivative. 
and I misspell the word response. Okay, let's fix that. And look back to my oscilloscope. The blue dots are the position data. The light blue dots are kind of the velocity data or the Y prime data. And I want to convolute Y prime and G. So I'm gonna take this light blue column and this dark black G column, and I'm gonna convolute them numerically. That means for every different T, I'm gonna flip the one column upside down. I'm gonna flip the G column upside down and then take this dot product. Now the problem that means is I've got to flip that column upside down 20 times. This is the part that I don't want you to worry about. So over here where I had a lot of spare space, I took that G column and I flipped it upside down 20 times. In fact, you can see that this G column right here is reproduced in all these columns exactly, but upside down. And then I dotted each of those with the light blue response data from the original signal. Then I added all those things together and produced a list of new responses. That's the convolution. That's my numerical estimate of what's gonna happen. Let's test it out and see how good it is. So don't worry, you know, like Wizard of Oz, don't worry about the, what's behind the curtain. Let's just see what happens if we take this new signal and replace it inside this F here. Now, by the way, my prediction is in red, but this table in dark blue is doing Euler's method. So now this is why I wanted to share my whole screen with you. I want to add this prediction column to the picture. Well, that's Excel stuff, right? So I'm going to select data. So now I'm sharing my screen so you see my dialog boxes. My dialog boxes are being recorded. I have to add some data to this picture. So what I do is add a series. I'm gonna name it Y prime convoluted with G. The X values, well, Excel calls them X. We're calling them T. These are the T values in my table. And the Y values, well, that's my prediction. And I wanna see how good my prediction is. So I don't know how much Excel you're used to doing, but eventually Excel is a pretty powerful program. Now my red predictions have been added to my oscilloscope. They've been added in brown or gold. I, I was doing this all morning and I don't know why. So I'm gonna change the color. I don't know why they don't stay red. Change the color of the marker to red. Change the color of the filling of the marker to red because I want that to be visually matching. Okay, now I got this red prediction. Now, by the way, you're saying, that red prediction isn't very different than the previous blue reality. Uh, but it depends on the scale I'm using right here, right? So now instead of a signal that's constantly one, let's replace it with a signal that is exponential decay. So I copy, and I'll be very careful because this column is a formula. So when I paste over here, I have to paste values. I don't want to paste the formula and rearrange my spreadsheet. Paste values. Let's look at how good my red prediction matches the new blue reality. Whoa. Ignore the black input signal for a second. 
I predicted that when I changed the black input signal, my new answer would be here in red. And the truth is in blue, pretty darn close. Now remember, this is all numerical estimates right now, right? And, and everything is so small in size. Let me zero in on this 0.25 to minus 0.25. I can do that by changing the scale here. And let's look at my prediction. My prediction is in red, reality is in blue. Uh, but let's be very careful, we're in a laboratory. So reality is what we're measuring. And my prediction is what I calculated best on measurements. So when I say reality is in blue, I'm uh, not being completely honest. My best measurement of reality is in blue. Let's go backwards and do this again. Let's give it a new signal and see if this predicts again. Let's make my new signal a sine wave. And the new signal is gonna be a sine wave and we're gonna have fun. Let's make it a sine wave that starts at Oh, I gotta remember how to write pi in Excel. I think it's PI function times T. So I'm doing more Excel stuff than you may be comfortable with. So that's a sine wave of period one second because I want my driver to have two sine waves in two seconds. And then I'm going to add 0 0.75 to raise the sine wave above the noise here, 0 0.25. Let's see what that looks like. I've left out a parentheses, my fault. I need a parentheses right there. I still don't like it. Blah, 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 blah. Minus equals, you typed blah, 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 cell shows. Okay. Oh, I didn't, T was not a cell. So I need to replace T with the cell that contains the T value. Okay. Still angry at me. Let's try it from the top. Copy, delete, 0 0.25 times sign. Doesn't matter, capitalization doesn't matter here in Excel. Two times pi, I believe pi is capitalized and it's a function in Excel times, but I'll change that next, t stop plus 0 0.75. Maybe I typed that better. Okay, for some reason it likes me now. Now I'll send down that whole column. And you didn't see this happen necessarily, but the red column automatically populated with my new prediction. So look at my new prediction is slightly different now. It doesn't match the exponential decay signal anymore. Now it's going to match this sine wave signal. So let's take the data from the sine wave signal and plug it into my oscilloscope, paste values like this. And now let's see, did my red prediction match the blue reality? And it's pretty darn good again. This is doing convolution numerically. Here's my sine wave input. And it's a rough sine wave. You see, I only sampled 20 values, but it's still a recognizable sine wave. Here's my output. It's going to have oscillation and decay. There's a damped harmonic oscillator. But again, let's zero in on minus 0.25 to 0 0.25. And let's look at a little more closely how that matches. Yeah, 
my red prediction is pretty close to the blue response, right? Now you don't see the signal anymore. The sine wave signal is up off the top of this chart now. But my red prediction is pretty close to the blue response. Now let's go totally crazy. And then if you'd like to ask a question about what this really means, we'll do that. Let's first put back an ordinary scale. At a larger scale, my prediction does not look remarkable, right? My prediction just looks like a red line. Right, what's the difference between the red line and blue line here? Well, they're both flat. No, they weren't both flat, but at that scale, it looks like they're both flat. So remember, you're not always showing the forcing function and the response at the same time because the forcing function could be way out of scale to the response. But now let's get crazy. I got a line for a forcing function. I got a exponential decay for a forcing function. I got a sine wave for a forcing function. Each one of them look, worked pretty well. How about if I take as my forcing function a randomly generated curve of just 20 random points. Now I'm going to do that in Excel. So I'm going to rewrite this thing here and I'm going to use, you know, my Excel mojo. I'm going to choose 20 random points between 0.5 and 1. So the command in Excel is rand. Um, it would be range 0 0.5 and raising it 0 0.5. So don't worry about what Excel command I used. Just say he's going to choose 20 random dots between 0 0.5 and 1. And I fill down. Nothing changed up here. Well, it's because I haven't put the signal in over there. But I do have the response recalculated. So I'm going to cut and paste this random noise signal into F. What I'm worried about when I do this is I'm going to make the thing recalculate. The random function in Excel recalculates when you adjust a cell. It did recalculate. It did recalculate with different numbers here. So I am not doing what I wanted to do there. So this may not be an awesome demonstration, but let's take a look. There's my random noise signal. It's not impressive. It's just 20 random dots. They don't have any pattern. Why don't they have any pattern? Because they're random. But in blue is supposed to be the reality from that random noise signal. And in red is supposed to be my prediction. Let's take a close up look at those two. from 0 0.25 to 0 0.25 negative. My predicted output is very close to the actual output. Now remember this light blue thing is like the change, the random number change as I was going through the signal. It's the change in the blue. So it's the Y prime. That's why I made it grayed out or I made it transparent because that's not part of our display, but it is part of our calculations. Where the transparent blue is rising, well, where the transparent blue is getting greater in value, the red and blue things are rising. Where the transparent blue thing is getting negative in value, the red and blue things are falling. 
So it's kind of another indicator on my oscilloscope. Now the problem that makes this not a perfect demonstration right there is I didn't count on the random number nature or the, the nature of the random function in Excel. Every time I generate a new column of random numbers, I'm gonna readjust my convolution integral. But when I paste the random numbers in here, I screw up, I recalculate, the spreadsheet recalculates my convolution estimate. So this was not super duper accurate. It's not the beginning I mind, it's the end where it's starting to verge. That doesn't look like it's trying to match. At the beginning, it looks like it's trying to match. Okay, so I'm not gonna say that my uh, prediction is excellent here. I'm gonna go back to just an exp. How about minus two T value? Stop, whoops, did I do that right? No, minus two times T value, stop. And then fill down. And then see there's, that's the previous one from the random number generator. Here's my red prediction for e to the minus two T. Now I'll copy and paste that in there to see how well my prediction worked. Yes, my prediction in red is very characteristic of the reality that I'm observing in blue. And I'm a little bit sensitive to the fact that this may be like ridiculously boring. But, but this is almost realistic. This is as close as I could come to building an oscilloscope from scratch in a spreadsheet. And of course, 20 dots is not super accurate, but it's not bad. Okay, let me stop sharing there because I haven't really given you the ability to look at this. I, this last example I did, some people are checking this out later. This is a little bit above and beyond the call of duty. You will do this though, if you continue in an engineering context and take a class in control systems. In control systems, it's all about here's the input, measure the output, adjust the input, create a feedback loop so you can make the box perform in a certain way. Those are called control systems. It's how your thermostat works. It's how your engine works. In a sense, it's the reason they put all those stupid chips in your car engine and you can't repair your car anymore. It's how the manufacturing line works in a way. It's probably got a lot of control systems in it. So I just wanted to give you an extra peek. It's not something that I would put on an exam. It's not something that you find in this book. Although by doing the convolution, these mathematical people, these authors, were teaching you the math that's required for you to learn the control systems, convolution Laplace transform. Okay. I apologize if this was too far off topic, but we were just trying to give you an exciting peek ahead. Uh, you know the rest of the drill, exam released. You can send me questions while you're working. I'll answer them if I can. I'll be honest if I can't. And uh, you guys have done a very good job. And I thank you for your attention. And uh, just finish strong. I am going to get all this stuff posted and you can contact me with anything you need before you do this last homework or while you're working on your exam over the weekend. I'll talk to you later. Bye.